On today's World Insight, having recovered from the pandemic, how can China also reinvigorate its economy? And I am confident with all these measures, and especially you now the pandemic has been contained in China. And the Hong Kong government doing its best to contain COVID-19 after months of social unrest. How's the economic and political situation in Hong Kong shaping up? Raymond Tam, a NPC deputy and also a seasoned politician who served several Hong Kong SAR administrations, explains. And finally, while the world waits for a COVID-19 vaccine, a renowned doctor in Shanghai discusses how to live alongside the pandemic. Welcome to Way Into Session, a special program of World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. The annual press conference of the Chinese top diplomat during the two sessions wrapped up on Sunday. Hot topics such as China-U.S. relations, global cooperation against the pandemic, and other regional security issues came under the spotlight. Some say relations between China and the United States are nearly touching their lowest point in history, but others are confident that the two sides will pull through with a phase one trade deal signed and with efforts to follow through. Here's my take right after the annual press conference by Mr. Wang Yi. The annual press conference of China's state councillor and foreign minister Wang Yi just wrapped up right behind me. A lot of questions coming from the press. The Chinese foreign minister answered them one by one. Certainly that demonstrates China's determination. Try to have and maintain friendship with a lot of countries and a lot of issues. He went as detailed as the number of surgical masks, medical gowns and aid to foreign countries that China has been providing since the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. He also stood China's ground on research about the source of coronavirus. He zeroed in on differences between China and the U.S. It's like facts and lies, science and prejudice, in his words. He did say China supports the process of identifying the source of the virus by the international science community. As long as the efforts are professional, impartial, and constructive, free from political interference, respect to sovereignty, and also equality of nations, and avoiding a presumption of guilt. It's been a turbulent year so far, geopolitics coupled with severe impacts of the pandemic. China's diplomacy has drawn attention, but usually interpreted in various ways through different lenses. China, meanwhile, has been, as a rising power, is on the verge, on the learning curve, to deal with complicated situations. That's reflecting the number of questions the foreign minister dealt with at the media briefing. However, one would notice China's top diplomat managed to open the doors still for all sides to work together, whether it's relations between China and the United States or China and European countries or China with international organizations like the United Nations. Though it is tough, nothing is set in stone. Efforts for peace, once made, would have far-reaching effects, we hope. I'm Tian Wei from the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. So how can frosty China-U.S. relations affect the Chinese economy? For answer, earlier I talked to Lin Yifu, the former World Bank chief economist. One of the things about uncertainty is not just about the pandemic, but also China-U.S. relations, uh, even though it's a geopolitics uh, uh, concept, but this time for the Chinese economy, very re relevant. So what about, you know, China-U.S. relations in terms of its uh, dampening effect on China's economy? Whether that we can maintain good relations, it's very much depend on the U.S. side. And I'd like to say, you know, no matter it's economic relations, political relations, and so on, to have good relations, it's important for China, for the U.S., and for the world. But Professor Lian, if you take a look at China-U.S. relations, I know you're an economist, you're not going to talk about politics, but if you look at that, 
you know, China-U.S. trade war, quote unquote, then uh, technological decoupling to a certain extent. And now we see U.S. forcing Chinese companies listed in the U.S. the stock market to withdraw. And then in the future, there's also likely to be, you know, political interactions within China and the United States regarding China's internal affairs, whether it's Taiwan or Hong Kong. So one after another, what does that mean for China to be able to provide to its own people the economic opportunities that they have been enjoying over the past uh, four decades during reform and opening up? The rights of China not only contributing to the improvement of well-being of the Chinese people, but also to the improvement of the well-being of the people in the world including people in the U.S. As you know, most of the export from China to the U.S. in the areas of more labor intensive, low value added related to the different necessities and because of the export of the Chinese product at a low cost with high quality and that allow the American people mm -hmm. to enjoy good life at a low cost. It seems that we could also think about things in a different direction. IMF, for example, predicted Chinese economy is likely to surpass that of the United States by the year 2050. Of course, that's only a prediction. Uh, and it's also about the GDP overall. But uh, according to Ray Dalio, uh, of course, a very well-known name in the investment field, uh, China is likely to pass that of the United States very soon as a result of a lot of uh, uh, combinations of factors, including the pandemic, including the trade war. Uh, Professor Lian, do you think there is another opportunity in that direction, though? I think it's certainly also unavoidable because China is four times of the U.S. population. Even the income per person in China is only a quarters of income per person in the U.S., the economic size in China will be as large as the U.S. size. And in terms of economic size, not only China will become bigger than the U.S. I think it's a novel later. India will also overtake the U.S. Again, because the population in India is four times of the population in the U.S. And uh, once India's per capita GDP reach one quarter of the U.S., India's in our economic size will overtake U.S. The economy towers over this year's two sessions. The COVID-19 pandemic has upended the world and may even irreversibly change the global economic landscape. China faces a huge unemployment challenge and tougher fiscal policy and is needed for debt risk prevention and control. So how can the country safely begin economic recovery? Is it necessary for China to raise its deficit ratio and issue special treasury bonds to help stabilize the battered economy? Let's listen to Professor Lin Yifu again. Tell me more about your thoughts of Chinese government deciding to drop the GDP target this year? I think it's a very realistic decision. It's most important to protect the job, the household, and the growth should be considered as adapting to the realistic situation in the coming months. And I think this decision is a very important decision mm. reflecting the Chinese government's intention to protect the people, to protect the job. Mm. Can we interpret this way though, Professor Li, and does it mean China foresees very much hard days ahead in the rest of the year? Well, everything is in relative speaking but there's still uncertainty about the possibility of second wave of outbreak and also the imported cases. But relatively speaking, I think that the economic situation in China is better than many other parts of the world. There were a set of policies 
and also possibilities uh, regarding how to stimulate the Chinese economy. Now, how much do you think those measures, as many as the 40 categories some even suggest, would really work at a time of difficulty? And under this, you know, huge impact from the pandemic, the government always need to respond. The Chinese measures is in the same direction as other countries. And uh, so the proposed measure, I think, is a necessity under current situation. And then certainly we should make these measures that reach the intended effects of protecting the people, protecting the small and medium-sized enterprises, and uh, you know, also pave the foundation for the future growth mm -hmm. of the Chinese economy. And from my readings, all the items are designed mm. in that direction. And the implementation, as you know, Chinese government, Chinese government has good yeah. reputation of good implementations. Uh, Professor Lian, one trillion government bond, that's something we haven't seen for quite some time. Uh, we see that pretty often during China's days when planned economy was pretty much in the play. Are we going back to the tools of planned economy, central planned economy? I think we need to understand the state or the government and the market is not either or. or. The governments and the, the markets always need to you know, function organically in any situation. Even in a normal time, we need to have a market competition and we also need to have the government to play facilitation role. But this competition certainly has to, you know, contingent on the economic situation. Currently, because of the shock from the pandemic and uh, mm. the market demand is insufficient and the government need to do more. And as I mentioned, it's not only the Chinese government, other governments in the world, they take a similar, you know, measures. And with the special bonds, because you know, the local governments, they face tension or their you know, difficulties or challenges in protecting the households, protecting the small medium sized enterprises, because those measures would be better to be carried out by the law level governments. But they don't have the fund. So these special bonds, you know, about one trillion the Chinese yuan is mainly you know, targeting for supporting the local governments to carry out this emergent job in this situation. So I think it is not a return to the planning economy. Otherwise, if you took about, if you, you know, see the measures that have been taken by the government in other countries, for example, U.S. already you know, proposed more than 10% of their GDP, and Germany similarly, Japan even proposed about 20% of their GDP to supporting their you know, economies. And uh, if you take that as a measure of returning to planning economy, then I think mm -hmm. that their you know, measure has been much larger. And, and, but you know, I do not see any discussion about the U.S. economy go to the planning economy, the Japanese economy going back to planning economy. So we should not treat this kind of major ideologically. We need to see what right. are the economic challenges and what would be the best way to cope with the challenges. And uh, under current situation, we need to have a government to help. Otherwise the market cannot function well. Right. Professor, then I would assume with the one trillion yuan, how to implement the local governments would, would be pretty much uh, in competition with one another or against one another for the fund, isn't it? Well, uh, first, it's a good sign that local governments, they are in competition to do their job. And secondly, in the allocation of the fund, the Chinese government certainly has certain <laughs> criteria. And based on these criterions, then there are some priority areas 
and a pro 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 priority uh, project to be carried out. And I think the allocation of the fund will based on this criteria. 3.6% deficit rate, that's quite a number. Unprecedented, uh, some suggest, uh, over the past years. Uh, how is China likely to deal with that deficit? And uh, what does it mean? Uh, we, of course, look at the short term because this is a really a huge challenge right now. But uh, what about the long term, uh, many wonder? Uh, this is a special case because this is a once in the, this pandemic is the most serious in a century. And under this kind of situation, we certainly need to take some you know, unusual or even extraordinary measures. And as I mentioned, you know, other countries like Germany has been very prudent in their fiscal policies. But even Germany you know, already adopted uh, measures that amounts to 10% of uh, uh, German uh, GDPs. So we need to understand that we are in a very you know, challenging circumstance in our times. And we should not use the you know, theory that applicable to the normal time to judge the action in this you know, particular times. China vows to create 9 million jobs. But many wonder when the economy is shrinking, struggling, how? That's really the ultimate question, isn't it? Yeah, I think that you know, to create to generate 9 million jobs is a huge task. And, and that task can only be carried out with certain growth in the Chinese economy. And the major we discuss will protect the household and will support their consumption that will generate demand. And that if you demand, then the enterprises can survive and you know, they can expand their business. And I think that the generation of jobs will come from the growth of the economy. And I'm confident with all these measures, and especially you now the pandemic has been contained in China, then China can maintain a reasonable growth rate and uh, to you know, make sure 9 million jobs will be generated uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, meet the demand of the people.